Chris Gelzer here with Matt Howell. Sorry, a little <laughs> late on the, on the button there. <laughs> ah, the world is crumbling, and you still can't manage. No, I've been very good about it. I know exactly when to say, to, to undo it. But like something was happening with my computer, I couldn't get to the button. Sorry. This week, <laughs> on the entirely professional first run, Matt and I are going to discuss Destin Daniel Cretton's Just Mercy. Featuring Michael B. Jordan, Jamie Foxx, and Brie Larson. Uh, we're also going to spend a few minutes talking about the new... I guess... I, I can't say it's a new version, right? We're just borrowing the title. The uh, French import Les Miserables. Which is France's official nomination or su- submission for the Academy Awards last year. Over Portrait of a Lady on Fire. So, we'll see if that was the right decision. We'll spend a few minutes talking about what's coming up in your physical media this upcoming Tuesday, featuring your streaming and straight-to-DVD picks of the week. And then finally, it's going to be some odds-making, where Matt and I are going to assign the odds of something happening, something not. But let's start everything off. Let's let's everybody take a deep breath. We're going to get all through all this together. It's a challenging time, but we're here for you. So let's spend a few minutes to talk about Just Mercy. What can I do for you today, Brian? I wanted to speak to you about Johnny D. McMillan. You know I wasn't part of his prosecution, right? That was way before my time. And that's exactly why I wanted to meet you. You see, I've read through the record quite a few times now, and I have some serious doubts about the reliability of his conviction. If you could take a look at the sections I've highlighted here, you'll see some problems with Ralph Meyer's testimony. Man, this is one of the most outrageous crimes in, in Monroe County history. Your client made a lot of people very angry. I understand that, but there are some serious problems with this case. And I was hoping that I can get your support to figure out what really happened. I already know what happened. Johnny D. McMillan was convicted by a jury of brutally murdering a teenage girl in my community. And it is my job to defend the integrity of that conviction. Even if that conviction is based on false testimony. You're the only one I know who thinks that. Then I must be the only one who read that record because it's pretty obvious. Damn. All right, Matt. So why don't you tell the fine folks at home, what is Just Mercy all about? So uh, Michael B. Jordan plays Brian Stevenson, a young uh, graduate of Harvard Law School who decides to move down to the Deep South and spend his time... um, defending death row cases as well as you know other cases where people can't maybe afford a lawyer and he gets involved in the case of one um walter johnny d mcmillan who was accused and convicted of uh, murdering a young uh, woman at a laundromat um and he believes was wrongfully convicted in the you know um racial south good times well no, quite <laughs> yeah, the I was opposite about to say. of that. Very, very <laughs> bad times. Matt, this is the latest film from Destin Daniel Cretton, who directed what I think may be a perfect film, and it's a first-run favorite, and I push it every time I can, and that is Short Term 12. So he did another film after that called, I believe it's called is it The Glass Castle, again with Brie Larson, which I confess I haven't had a chance to see yet. And he returns now with Just Mercy, the based on true story of Brian Stevenson. And Matt, as far as kind of courtroom dramas and, and mission-based films go, uh, what are your thoughts on Just Mercy? And it, it, it seems to kind of fly under the radar initially, but during this current kind of time, it's, it's, it's gotten a little more... Uh, um, notoriety isn't the right term, but it's it's got it's 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 more out there in the cultural zeitgeist, considering the current circumstances. Featuring, of course, one of the um, better up and coming actors right now, Michael B. Jordan, Jamie Foxx, of course, Brie Larson, uh, as well as Tim Blake Nelson, and some more. What what are your thoughts on Just Mercy? I thought this was quite good. I thought it was well done, well acted. Um, I will say. It's not anything you haven't seen before, which in and of itself is an indictment of what this is about, since that's essentially, it's essentially a true story, I'm sure, dramatized to an extent. But, um, you know, it's something that we've seen before, and whether you've 
are looking at something like, um, you know, a Mississippi burning or a dead man walking or something to that nature there, are, it hits some familiar beats, but that doesn't necessarily take away from its impact. And I mean, obviously, you know, so you're spending your time with, um, Johnny D and his family and Jamie Foxx is excellent in this. Um, mm. it really just kind of makes you angry just at the hesitance of what a people who are supposed to be upholding the law are to even look at it, the things that they're doing to prevent people from looking at it to, for whatever bigoted reasons that they may have. And this stuff, it, it was not even that long ago and it's still happening today. So I think it's definitely worth a watch, even given its current climate. Um, I think it takes on a whole new light with the kind of stuff that's going on right now in, in the forefront of the U.S. But uh, yeah, I thought it was a really well done film. I mostly agree with you. I think Jordan is quite good in this. And he, I think, likely portrays Stevenson, I think, as he is. I've seen him interviewed uh, a lot over the years. But I got to admit, I felt that Jordan's uh, performance was kind of reserved, right? I felt like I wanted to see some more righteous indignation. A table slam, a you're out of order moment, right? Totally implausible I get in the surroundings. In likely not who Stevenson was as a person, but I think I I wanted that kind of emotional catharsis, which I never really got. There uh, there is the moment, of course, as the trial unfolds and you get some uh, uh, some relief. Um, I don't want to spoil too much about it, but the whole film kind of played like that to me. It does portray the indignity and the intimidation of the experience, I think, quite well. But it also felt a little reserved and almost sanitized to me, right? Unlike like a film like Mississippi Burning, which is another movie that has its problems, but you get that you know real sense of danger kind of almost all the time. And then Gene Hackman just and, and Willem Dafoe just kind of like snapping and and taking matters in their own hands. And when you know Hackman brings in some of his old buddies into town to kind of shake things up and. Listen, it's a, it's a statement film, and it's well told, and it's done confidently, I think, with a clear vision and earnestness. And there is an emotional kind of tear-provoking conclusion, but for the most part, I just wanted more... What, Matt? I'm not sure. I just wanted a little more... Uh... You wanted more fireworks. You want a little yeah. more indignation. Um, but I guess the thing is, and I, I, I absolutely see what you're saying, and normally, especially given everything that's going on right now... If I had taken this in a vacuum, I would probably agree with you. I feel like it's probably the reason that it kind of flew under the radar um, before current events is that it's not a particularly um, narratively compelling film in the, in the way that they present it. But I think when you take a step back and you realize that this thing is based on true story, mm -hmm. um, I respect by the fact that they kind of didn't go for some of the kind of histrionic over the top stuff that you would see in these kinds of things to kind of show you the banality of it all. And just kind of like how yeah. it's just, it's just the institution of the way things are. Like if you had, you know, um, Jordan making a impassionate fiery speech in the middle of the courtroom, which you would expect to see like Denzel in Philadelphia or something like that, then that's great from a narrative standpoint and watching it on the film, but it's not true to life. And I think people are going to go out and look and see, did Brian Stevenson really say this in this court? And when it comes back that, no, he did not. Does that hurt the story some? So I think, I think that's a very appropriate response. The way they did it was trying to eschew some of those dramatics in exchange for maybe some more realism or verisimilitude. I I think you're right about that, and that's what I meant too about because every interview I've seen with him, he's an intense but still kind of soft spoken and measured kind of guy, mm -hmm. right? And and then Jordan clearly kind of portrays that in this film, so I don't think it's fair for me to knock it. I guess it's more of a personal preference. I'm a big fan of the courtroom drama. I you right. know, in fact, I just rewatched the, what the Lincoln Lawyer for like the third or fourth time a couple of weeks ago because I was I was baking. <laughs> it's just a good background <laughs> movie. But I, I kind of I just like those kind of fiery moments, which you're not get your right. twelve angry men, which you're not going to get here. So I, I try not to hold it against the film because that's more of a personal preference for me, and it's not particularly what the story that Cretton is is telling us, right? So that's fine. Uh, I think uh, Brie Larson is pretty solid in this, but I agree with you. Jamie Fox 
is great in this. Uh, I think he's the standout uh, of this film. I feel like I'm being too hard on Jordan then because he's just portraying Brian Stevenson as he is. So I don't know if I should really hold that against him when Fox gets to have the more interesting uh, uh, role here. Of the right. Two of them. Mm-hmm. So in the end, Matt, I think I'm giving Just Mercy a B. What about you? Yeah, I'm going to give it a B plus. I'm not a biggest fan of courtroom dramas as you are, but I think it's something, especially with its availability and everything going on, everybody should check it out. And it is available to rent for free on all of your platforms, at least as of the date of this recording. Um, I think it will be for a while, and you can also buy it pretty cheap. I think it's like four bucks. So uh, if you haven't had a chance to check it out, I would recommend seeing it, especially given the current events that we're all experiencing. It's quite, uh, I think, quite good and worth your time. Cretan's directing Shang-Chi. So is he? Yeah. And uh, from okay. what I understand, I was reading up about that, is they're reintroducing the Mandarin. So okay. I guess the Ben, I'm assuming maybe they get Ben Kingsley one. It was a different take, obviously, but not the real Mandarin. Right, was... I guess we're going to see. And I think it's Henry Golding, too. So that should be pretty interesting. Okay. But, uh, I'm curious to see what Critton does with Shang-Chi. And it's, uh, and it's the Legends of the Ten Rings. So it's Shang-Chi and the Legends of the Ten Rings. Well, yeah, because the Mandarin. There you go. If you've had a chance to see Just Mercy, shoot us an email at feedback at thefirsttorun.com. Matt, coming up on Physical Media this upcoming Tuesday, June 16th, there is not a lot. So uh, we'll spend a few minutes talking about that. But I'm going to, there's a big 4K box set coming out featuring some fantastic films. And here's a clip from one of them. Now then, Dimitri, you know how. We've always talked about the possibility of something going wrong with the bomb. The bomb, Dimitri. The hydrogen bomb. Well, now, what happened is um, one of our base commanders, he had a sort of, well, he went a little funny in the head. You know, just a little funny. And... uh, He went and did a silly thing. Well, I'll tell you what he did. He ordered his planes to attack your country. Uh, Well, let me finish, Dimitri. Let me finish, Dimitri. Well, listen, how do you think I feel about it? Can you imagine how I feel about it, Dimitri? So that, of course, is Peter Sellers and Sandy Kubrick's absolute stone-cold classic film, Dr. Strangelove, or I Want to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb. I never really caught up with this one, Matt, for years because I always heard how great it was, but I felt mm-hmm. it was one of those things where, yeah, I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's fine. Mm-hmm. And I watched it, and I was just blown away by how good it is and how funny it is, particularly Peter Sellers, who plays three different roles in this thing and is absolutely brilliant and probably should have won an Oscar for each one of them. If that's possible. So that is part of Columbia Classics Volume 1. They are releasing a box set. It's the only way to get these films on 4K for now. So, of course, there's Dr. Strangelove. Also included is Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, Lawrence of Arabia, Gandhi, A League of Their Own, and Jerry Maguire. There are pretty much all the older ported over uh, speech special features from the prior Blu-ray releases of these films. Dr. Strangelove has uh, one new featurette. Stanley Kubrick considers the bomb, uh, but they all have new 4K uh, restorations or transfers. Some uh, Dolby Atmos uh, soundtracks. Gandhi, Jerry Maguire's got it. So uh, as does a League of Their Own. So there you go. You can pick these up as part of this massive box set. And I think it's actually not too expensive. I think it's like a hundred bucks right now. Yeah, one hundred twelve dollars on Amazon. If you wanted to grab this, so we'll see. Man, I had a, a heartbreaking incident in my home last week really my my 4k player stopped working (gasps) i've had it for two and a half years and it no longer works it started with i was watching the verdict the paul newman film Mm -hmm. just on blu-ray and again courtroom drama and uh it stopped it's it when I started up again one night, it just read that the disc wasn't finished, like it was a DVDR or something. So right. I put in my David Bowie SACD copy of Heathen. That's right, I have one of those. Mm-mm-mm. You know how rare <laughs> that thing is. Anyway, so I have that. I put that in, it worked. So I'm like, okay. 
And I started it up again and it worked. So that's fine. I'm watching the verdict. I go to bed. I got to get up the next day. You know, I'm starting cooking dinner the next night. I'm going to put the verdict down. I'm going to finish this up. I got about a half an hour to go. No disc. I swap out CD, a Blu-ray, a DVD, 4K. No disc. <sighs> so it's currently getting looked at. I'm going to see how much it's going to cost to fix. Right. I was going back and forth and waiting to get a PlayStation 5 instead. Yeah. But that's not going to be until the holidays. And it's probably going to be, what, 400 bucks, maybe five. Yeah, it's probably gonna be four or five hundred dollars. You can get like a, you can get one now for like a four K player for like one hundred and fifty bucks. So, I looked it up. I could only find them. I think the cheapest I saw was like one eighty. I don't know. Either way, so no, no, it was like still two hundred something. I think really, it's off season. I don't think okay. they're gonna wait till Black Friday to get it. Like I got this one at Black Friday. It's a good one too, but it's a nice Sony one. But I haven't had anything break down that early in a long time. It's very heartbreaking. So I am without a 4K player right now. That's all right. We'll get through it together. Three Christ is being released, featuring Richard Gere, Peter Dinklage, Walton Goggins, and Bradley Whitford. Uh, three Christ followed Dr. Alan Stone, who is treating three paranoid schizophrenic patients in Michigan, each of whom believe they are Jesus Christ. What transpires is both comic and deeply moving. The Query, starring Shea Wiggum and Michael Shannon. A mysterious new minister takes up residence at a rundown church in a desolate Texas town. Despite the growing suspicions of the town folk, the hardened local police chief, the drug dealing brothers caught in the chief's crosshairs, and the mournful woman who keeps up the church, the congregation grows. But how long can the minister keep his secret safe? And who can be forgiven when the truth comes to light? Based on the acclaimed novel. Listen, it's got Michael Shannon in it, so I'm interested in checking it out. Are you an impractical jokers guy? I mean, I've seen it in the back, but sometimes it's funny, but it's not really something I have to watch. Well, you know they put a movie out last year or earlier this year? I don't even know. I heard that, yeah. Well, now you can own it, I guess. So, there. Deadly Crush is coming out, starring William Sadler, Courtney Gaines, Jenna Willis, and Judy Tenuta. When a painter rents a secluded cabin to jumpstart her creativity, she has intercourse with a ghost. Dan Aykroyd style, and finds yourself part of this wicked plan to bring itself back to life. Oscilloscope Pictures is bringing us St. Francis. After an accidental pregnancy turned abortion, a deadbeat nanny finds an unlikely friendship with a six-year-old she's charged with protecting. All right, Matt. This seemed to come out pretty frequently. We have a new sniper film. How many sniper movies have there been? Give me a number. Uh, six. This is the eighth. Oh, wow. Okay. Special Ops sniper Brandon Beckett is set up as the primary suspect for the murder of a foreign dignitary on the eve of signing a high-profile trade agreement with the U.S. Narrow escaping death, Beckett realizes that there may be a dark operative working within the government and partners with the only person he can trust, his father, legendary sniper sergeant Thomas Beckett. I think that's Tom Berenger's character from the original. original oh, sniper. wow. Wow. The original Matt came out the year I graduated high school. 1993. Wow. And we're churning out sniper movies. <laughs> sniper 2, Sniper 3, Reloaded, a Legacy, Ghost Shooter, Ultimate Kill, and now finally, no, I shouldn't say finally, and next, Assassin's End. New to Blu-ray, Criterion is releasing The Cameraman. Hopelessly in love with a woman working at MGM Studios, a clumsy man attempts to become a motion picture cameraman to be close to the object of his desire. It's a brand new 4K restoration undertaken by Cineteca de Bologna, the Criterion Collection, and Warner Brothers. A new score by composer Timothy Brock. Audio commentary from 2004 featuring Glenn Mitchell, author of A to Z of silent film comedy. Spite Marriage. Buster Keaton's next feature for MGM following the cameraman in a 2K restoration with a 2004 commentary by film historians John Bankston and Jeffrey Vance. And more. So if you are a Buster Keaton fan, you can finally pick up his The Cameraman. Paramount is releasing a brand new 4K restoration, but only on Blu-ray, of Pretty in Pink. Includes a new filmmaker focus, director Howard Dutch on Pretty in Pink, a new isolated score track, and the original Lost Dance ending. I've seen Pretty in Pink, I think, once. It's okay. Yeah, it's one of those... I, I... Don't know if I've ever seen it, to be quite honest with you. I, I think I don't see I've, I've seen any of those Molly Ringwald movies except for The Breakfast Club. Mm, I think part of it is that I, I hate Ducky. I think that was the beginning of my, I don't know, I'm not a big John Cryer guy. No offense, John. I don't know what it is. I'm just. 
First snow, a man desperately tries to keep a strange prediction from coming true in his, this independent psychological thriller. Jamie Starks, played by Guy Pierce, is a traveling salesman who is in New Mexico on business when he crosses paths with a psychic. The psychic offers to read Jamie's fortune and quickly informs him that he will die before the first snow of the winter. Jamie's girlfriend, Deirdre, played by Piper Parabo, doesn't think much of this prediction, but with the winter months on the horizon, this notion makes Jimmy a bit nervous. Takashi Miike's Sukiyaki Western Django is getting a Blu-ray release. Includes an extended cut of the film, Matt, but only in standard definition. What kind of BS is that? Includes some deleted scenes that I'm making a featurette as well. Have you ever seen The Hills Run Red? I have not. It's a pretty good uh, throwback to the 80s slasher horror film. It's actually quite good. It came out about, I don't know, it's been 10 years now? But I was a big fan of this when I first saw it. I bought it on, it was actually one of, probably one of the last movies I bought at Blockbuster when, in the used section. Right. I used to love uh, cruising that. I'd go to the end, near the end, I was back when we were, we were working in Simsbury, Connecticut. I would go to that one in Simsbury in that plaza, like on a oh, Friday really? after work, because yeah. I was so desperately alone. And then just kind of walk and look at all the uh, used uh, Blu-rays there and pick some up. And I got this one watching. I was actually quite impressed with it. There are a ton of new features on this, including a new audio commentaries, two of them, a bunch of new interviews as well. So if you haven't seen The Hills Run Red, I would recommend it if you're a horror slasher fan. It is uh, pretty damn entertaining. 1987's Primal Scream from Dark Forest is coming out. In the future, a private detective tries to stop a large corporation from mining an element not named Obtanium, whose side effects include igniting human flesh and destroying internal body parts. That sucks. Warner Archive is giving us Romance on the High Seas, a brand new 4K restoration of that classic film. And then there is a Steelbook release for the 40th anniversary of Friday the 13th coming out. Matt, there is rumored to be a new Friday the 13th box set coming out at some point this year. I don't know if it's going to be 4K or not. Okay. It may be. B. I haven't heard for sure yet. I think it's going to be 4K. And I'm still go- wavering back and forth and buying that Dawn of the Dead box set I think we talked about earlier. Mm-hmm. So I have to pull trigger on that relatively soon. I'm waiting for, I think, uh, Diabolic uh, Diabolic DVD to uh, lock in how many they're going to get. And I'll probably get it from them instead of trying to order it myself from overseas. Right, right. So we'll see. And then finally, a couple uh, Blu-rays coming out on 4K, I should say. Gladiator and Braveheart are getting 4K releases. You can buy them as singles or as a two-pack. Your straight-to-DVD pick of the week is Lieutenant Jangles from 2018. It's the mid-1980s in the most crime-ridden city of Australia. Only one man keeps the scales of justice even. Cowboy detective Lieutenant Jangles. After his partner is killed in a blazing shootout, Jangles goes on an explosive and blood-soaked mission to avenge his death. His quest for vengeance unintentionally makes him the enemy of the mysterious new crime boss who's been quietly taking over Brisbane City. When their paths finally cross, Matt, one thing is made clear. This town isn't big enough for the both of them. What should we be streaming this week? So I'm going to recommend Ad Astra, a Brad Pitt vehicle from last year where it's the near future. Um, the Earth is in serious trouble from a environmental perspective. And he is sent on a mission out to the far reaches of the solar system to find uh, his long-lost father, who disappeared on a mission to the outer planets many, many years ago. It's a pretty cool little sci-fi film. There are moon pirates, which is a fun little scene in it. Um, Mm -hmm. It's available on uh, that newfangled HBO Max, uh, HBO Now, HBO Go. Yeah, I I rather enjoyed that, Astra. It's quite good for long stretches. And then sometimes it's, it's yeah, no. And there's a weird, not, I shouldn't say weird, but there's a cameo or a star appearance that just kind of comes out of nowhere and you're like, oh, yeah. yeah. It, <laughs> it almost kind of takes you out of the whole film. I don't know why. It's, it's just a weird moment. So, but still worth checking out. That's a good pick. Let's spend a few minutes then and talk about the Les Miserables, France's entry for Best International Film in last year's Oscars. J'en appelle à votre esprit d'équipe. La cohésion. Sans cohésion, pas d'équipe. Et sans équipe, on est seul. J'ai pas choisi la bonne équipe, mon pote. Hein. 
Contrôle de police. Vous faites quoi, là On attend le bus. Vous attendez le bus, là Ça sent le shit, ça. Eh, hey, c'est bon, c'est Je vous filme, vous avez pas le droit de faire ça. Arrête de filmer. Non. T'es contente, là Ici, c'est notre vie. Toi, tu débarques, nous, ça fait 10 ans qu'on est là. On est les seuls à se faire respecter. Eh hey, les gars, les gars, ils se lèvent, ils se lèvent. Tu qu'ils respectent, tu me parles. Les gens d'ici, ils ont peur de vous, c'est tout. So, Matt, Les Miserables stars Damien Bernard as Brigadier Stefan Ruiz. And he has been transferred to a, a new unit here. And he gets partnered with two officers who may not be quite as clean as him. And they get involved in, they kind of work in cooperation with some underworld figures there. And then one of the, one, <laughs> there's a gypsy touring, is gypsy a slur now? Can I say that? I can't, I'm not I think, sure. I think it is. Okay, great. Well, <laughs> there's a group of people who run a traveling circus and their tiger gets, one of their, ba their baby lion cub, right, gets stolen. Right. Mm -hmm. And they, uh, the local, um, the mayor of this town, which I'm not 100% sure, Matt, if he's the actual mayor or if he's just the in charge of this neighborhood as a bad guy, um, which I think is what, it, what actually is happening here, right? Because his office, right. I wouldn't exactly say, is at City Hall. Right. So this group of circus people <laughs> come to the mayor saying, listen, you stole my baby cub tiger. And then a fight starts to break out. The cops show up. The cops get involved. Now they have to find the the uh, the I shouldn't say tiger, the lion cub. And it turns out that's a a gang of kids, particularly one kid who always gets in trouble for stealing things. And things, and then the cops interact with the kids, and everything unravels from there. So they're the the police are crooked, and they go a little too far. They're a little violent with these kids. And then there's a bit of a riot at the end of the film, uh, kind of. And it's touted as an explosive piece of cinema and a tale of our times, I guess, in a way, just like Just Mercy is uh, when it comes to uh, uh, misanthropic police forces, right, and getting into trouble and starting problems for people. And what happens when those, those, some of those people uh, rise up and fight back. So, Matt, this was France's submission for the oscars last year over over portrait of a lady on fire which is a film that changed me in some capacity internally <laughs> was this the right decision should they have stuck with Leia Miz, or should they have submitted portrait what do you think oh geez i mean i think well we all know what chris is gonna say mm. obviously it was the wrong choice and i i was not changed by portrait of a lady on fire i think because chris built it up so damn much i was yeah. expecting something akin to a religious experience to watching it which didn't happen but it's a good film and i have to say they should have gone with that over this because this is while timely in a lot of ways especially i mean france is not immune to this stuff i mean we were watching the riots several times over the past few years and how the police interact with the public there um But in a lot of ways, it's just kind of your typical kind of crooked cop, kind of like one day on the mean streets kind of film. And it doesn't really break any ground. It's not as, it's definitely not as artistically worthy as, as Portrait of a Lady on Fire is. No, absolutely not. I think that though this Le, Le Miserable is, a, is a ta another tale of the moment of what's been happening as of late, uh, it's, it, it's, it is well directed. It's well acted, but it, as you said, it never rises above your typical crooked police crime drama fair. It just it doesn't. Not maybe not at least until the almost literally explosive finale, right? I think once we get to the conclusion of this film, those last 20 minutes, I think yeah. the thing really gets some steam going and gets on a roll. But unfortunately, prior to that, it, it's it's too focused on on setting up the chain of events. I almost wonder too if it's too short it's only about what it's 103 minutes long uh, the pacing is there and the finale is a roller coaster but the build-up just never connects with me it doesn't feel organic just orchestrated right we need a to go to b then c to go to d for a and f to collide that's kind of how it felt to me throughout the whole thing i don't know if maybe it just didn't feel raw enough for me it's not as severe 
and as intense as I think it could have been. Now, I think it's maybe hamstrung by the plot machinations, the way they set the finale up for that not to have happened. But I just don't know. It, it just was kind of just like you said, this kind of traditional crooked cop uh, crime drama thing. I don't know if I'm more just colored by the reality of our time that I'm looking for more, but it just, it's fine. It's entertaining. And as I said, the finale is great, but the rest of it is just kind of, yeah, okay. Yeah, let's watch this again for the hundredth time. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I mean, it has its moments. I mean, and like the the climax is is you know kind of edge of your seat riveting kind of stuff, and I was really into it then. Mm-hmm. But I mean, I don't know how many other times we can say it. I mean, if you've seen any of these films, and I'm not saying that these other films are as good as this, but I mean, if you've seen Chris's favorite film, Training Day, or if oh, you've God. seen <laughs> if you've seen something like End of Watch, these are films that you're going to be intimately familiar with. You're going to recognize all the story beats. It came from another country, so it's obviously got a bit of a flavor of their own social aspects and, and their culture. But other than that, there's not enough really to elevate this above that kind of fare. Now, I mean, it's a fun film. Um, you know, it's an entertaining watch, but it's not anything groundbreaking. No, unfortunately not. I, even stolen lion cubs aren't enough really to push it over the top for me <laughs> uh, but i think on the strength of its ending uh, i ended up giving uh way miserable a b minus that's what i gave it as well the, b- despite having a clever MacGuffin, i'm giving it a b minus <laughs> great i don't know if i should even post in our report card page why do i even post both of our scores at this point i'm just gonna <laughs> just do a show score <laughs> That's not fair. I'm looking at our scores right now over the last few weeks in my little notebook as I go through, and it's like we both gave Zap the D. Capone got a, I gave it a D, gave it a D minus. Fast Times B plus B. We're always pretty close. We'll get well, there, folks. When the arguments hit, they are good. So don't just you uh, hang tight for that. You know, I mean, here's the thing, guys. There's over 500 episodes of this. Yes. We've seen hundreds of films. I think. We know what we're doing at this point. So if we both say it's a D film, it's a D film. Now there's some gray degrees there, but you know, I think that's fair. That's true. That's a very good way to put it. I'm not going to knock us ever again. That's a great way to put it. We are the authority. Yes. The movie authority. We are as far mo- as middle-aged white guy podcast. This is it. <laughs> you want to know what the opinions are? The be all end all opinion of middle-aged white guys right here that's right sure. this is america's movie podcast right now that's right it's just an email feedback at the first run.com way miserable is currently available on amazon prime if you are part of their streaming service you can rent it everywhere else all right man, let's spend a few minutes and jump into some odds making this first one oh, I, I i it just pains me to even discuss this but i really think this is where we're going and we'll talk about that when we get back are you going to tell us who you work for? I was always very interested to meet you. I'd heard so much about you from Vespa. You th- the real shame is that if she hadn't killed herself, we would have had you too. I think you would have done anything for her. Well, you know you're not in Britain, and God knows where you'll be tomorrow. Which should tell you that eventually you will tell us about the people you work with. And the longer it takes, the more painful we'll make it. <laughs> You really don't know anything about us. <laughs> it's so amusing because we are on the other side thinking, oh, the MI6, the CIA, they're looking over our shoulders, they're listening to our conversations, and the truth is you don't even know we exist. Well, we do now, Mr. White. And we're quick learners. <laughs> oh, really? Well, then... The first thing you should know about us is that we have people everywhere. And that, of course, is from Quantum of Solace. Not the best Daniel Craig Bond film, but I will say, uh, I think it's Craig at his most brutal. I think Mark Foster, what he does in that film, is even more so than Casino, that he is a blunt object, right? He is, it is the most brutal Craig film I think we've had. So, uh, particularly that fight in the uh, hotel room, oh, that is some top shelf Bond uh, action right there. So, Matt, what are the odds 
Well, let me let me set it up. I saw it again. I was doing some research for the show tonight, trying to come up with some different odds making uh, opportunities mm-hmm. for us. And I saw this. I think it was at Screen Rant. And I've been seeing this a little bit around here. I didn't even click on the article because I saw the headline. I knew exactly what it was going to be. Um, so I could be full of poop right now, and I'm just using my own assumptions. <laughs> Though that the way, all right. So I feel like with the reboot with Daniel Craig. And the plot line we've had is that they've basically pinned themselves into a corner. Because he went from a, a freshly minted 007 to now being retired and on his way out the door, right? Semi-retired on his way out. So what are the odds that in No Time to Die, at the end, Bond transitions to a code name character only? So it will no longer be James Bond. It'll be Mike Smith who adopts the James Bond code name. Um, this has been a fan theory for a while too, which is time, right? dispelled by the fact of the existence of his wife. Right. right. So I'm going to say 30%. I mean, I guess they could paint themselves under a corner, but it doesn't seem right to me. Like James Bond should be this kind of ageless character, like Mad Max or something that just can be played by different actors. And I think it, I think they would be better served by just kind of throwing out the continuity or at least soft rebooting it somehow and not worrying about the whole, you know, aging Bond kind of thing. So what do you say for the next film in the series? You just kind of eschew everything that's happened in the last few films? You just kind of kick it out the door? Yeah, or you just kind of make it more of a, a reference, I guess. I'm not a, I'm not the diehard Bond fan here, but I, I swear to God, like I do not care about Bond continuity. As far as I'm watching any particular one of them, it's basically a brand new film. As far as I'm concerned, it has no continuity other than you know M and James Bond and Q. That's it. That's really okay. the only thing. So I mean, I don't see the big deal about you know continuing to do that. I hope that's what happens. I just feel like that there's going to be because the headline was basically rumors are a major change in the franchise. And I feel like this is what it would be because they've built it up where he's older, he's retired now. So the other thing too is I'm terrified. Terrified. Let's you know, let's be real here. But I'm concerned that he's going to die at the end. He'll save oh. someone's life. He'll die, and then they'll pass on his name to the next agent in honor of uh, as an homage to him. Which I just coming out of my mouth as I say, it sounds more and more likely that that may be the case. So then yeah. for the next film, do they stick with that? Or do they just do, like you say, a soft reboot and they just say he came out of retirement, but he was not that old to begin with. He retired young right. and he came back. Yeah. And that way that brings in Tom Hardy, which would be perfect. Maybe. Yeah. I really just hope that um, what I would really want, I have this perverse desire to see like an American actor play James Bond doing a British accent just so you could hear the entire UK freak out. <laughs> if a British actor gets to play Superman and we're supposed to be okay with it, like it's no big deal. And Spider-Man too. An American should play James Bond just to piss the Brits off. That's what I want. Calling it here. I okay. think it would be hilarious. Have you seen the screen test where James Brolin was testing for the role? No, I did not. Uh, you should, you, that's on YouTube. You can check that out. I'm going to go 60% that they're going to transition to a code name. I, oh, okay. It pains me to say wow. it, but that's what I'm thinking it's going to happen. Wow. Well, and you're the James Bond expert, so it must be that must be a pretty solid 60%. Guys, if you're betting people, I'd go with what Chris says on this one. Uh, I hope I'm wrong. I really do. I just, I'm just i very pessimistic about this. We'll see. Okay. Because right, so, oh, what's his name right. there, too? Kerry Fukunaga said, too, that they've taken the, they've taken the series in a new direction. You know, they've, there have been little hints like this all the way through. I'm thinking, sure. what could those things be? Because they've spent the last few films reestablishing the character and the on all the traditional kind of stuff the q m the office you know all that stuff bringing it back to the what we've always known uh for the character instead of him being right. just young rogue agent so anyway sorry go ahead i mean what's left to change jane bond yeah yeah that could be it mm-hmm. could be american james bond it's gonna be jim bond <laughs> Seth Rogen right. is James Bond. Jim Bond. James Franco is Jim Bond. <laughs> Dave Franco as Q. Oh. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm going to do a lightning round here, okay? Oh, boy. Um, so we're getting at where COVID's, you know, things are slowly starting to get back to normal. Um, we're starting to get a lot more 
buzz or a lot more information around Matt Reeves' Batman um, as hopefully filming starts up relatively soon. But he's hinted at that he's bringing in the Joker. Not necessarily in this first film, but setting him up for maybe two, film two or three out of this planned trilogy that they have. So I'm going to do a lightning round of, of possibilities of who this might, new Joker might be. Okay? okay. You can yeah, reach one. So Lakeith Stanfield. I would go I would go again like sixty percent on that. I think he'd be a great pick for that. Okay. Michael Shannon. Nah, fifteen percent. I, I don't see it. I just no. don't I don't know. I don't see it. He's weird enough too, but I just don't know if that's too much gravitas, I think, in a way. Too too much. You don't want to hear him say the words compon? <laughs> <laughs> I just don't see, I don't know what it is I don't see it it's Shannon plus I don't know if you'd want to go that old okay Jake Gyllenhaal Ugh, I don't want that I'd rather see him as Batman than Joker if I had to choose one so I'll go 35% on that more than he's Shannon pretty, he was but... pretty weird in, uh, in Nightcrawler he was yeah he was bad. I just don't I don't know I just don't I don't okay. want it. plus he's so yeah. much fun as Mysterio yeah that's true and then lastly, uh, Caleb Landry Jones. Who's that? The redheaded kid from Get Out. The okay. terrifying, the terrifying lacrosse player. Right, 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 right. I'll go. I think it's a stronger contender too. So I'd probably go 50, 50, 51% on that. 51%, 51%. On that one. Okay, very good. All right. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, Lakeith is getting some buzz just because I think he posted a video of himself dressed up as the Joker, kind of a cross between. Keith Ledger's Joker and Jared Leto's, which I, that's something you want to stay away from. Like, yes. uh, <laughs> with, uh, with the grill that he had in his mouth. But um, yeah, I, I, it looks pretty good, but I'm kind of hoping whatever Joker we get is not the kind of um, manic Joker that we've seen with Joaquin Phoenix or with um, Jared Leto. Mm-hmm. Um, I hope it's more of a kind of, I don't necessarily subdued, but more of a kind of a, like a quietly menacing or at least a little bit more that kind of not on all the time Joker that we get that it kind of explodes. That's the one I'm hoping that we get. We'll see. Yeah. That's pretty good. All right, Matt. What are the odds Bill and Ted face the music clears 80% in Rotten Tomatoes? Did you see oh, the trailer today? I did. Long- I did. I did. Yeah. I'm going to say 65% chance. I was never super on board with this, but I I don't know. I don't know. I think it's 65%. I I think it's going to be better than Bogus Journey, at least. And so that's something. I'm not as confident. I'm going 53%. I still think it's got a shot, but yeah. I don't. There's something. Some people are like, I saw on Twitter, they're really happy and pleased with the, tra- with the trailer, and it gave them a lot of joy. And I'm like, yeah. Thought it was okay. It was pretty good. I tweeted like "buckle up," but right. I, the more I thought about it after I first watched it, I'm like, "Is this gonna work?" I don't right. know if this is gonna work. So I guess we'll find out. Yeah, I'm not confident. Yeah, we'll see. Maybe they're just, but you know what? Maybe they're doing the smart thing and keeping the best stuff out of the trailer. Which you know what? I commend the restraint hmm. if that's the case. All right, so we're getting the Snyder cut. Apparently, Dark Side's gonna be in it. What are the odds that Dark Side's actually going to look cool? Well, we are getting the Snyder version of Steppenwolf, which was, you know, teased in Batman vs Superman. Right. Um, I think though, which I, I didn't think was that great, to be honest with you. Mm-hmm. Um, other than Doomsday design worked, was right on the money, but I just didn't. Uh, no, I. But I think Dark Side is kind of hard to screw up, unless they go really far afield from it. And ignore, right. you know, that the kind of classic design. Yeah. So I think it'll be what. So the odds that it'll be good or a cool design that, or it'll be a cool design. Yeah. So like, who was the bad guy in Justice League? Steppenwolf. Yeah. He looked lame. He looked stupid. Yeah. He looked basically like a generic, you know, gray bad guy. That's what this. I have a feeling that this is what's going to be. I can't. I can't imagine Snyder's going to be able to avoid that. No, because I think... Well, here's the thing. That's a good point. Because he's not going to really be in it, right? It's not going to be a dark side film, per se. Right, right. So... But as long as we get the red eyes with the Omega Beams in some capacity... 
right. then it'll be badass. So I'll go, I'll say, I'm a little more confident. I'll go 63 on that, 63%. Yeah, I'm going to go 45% that that thing looks cool. I don't think it's going to look cool at all. I think he's somehow even going to mess up Omega Beams. Uh, I hope not. I'm really getting amped up for a movie that's going to more than likely be not good at all. <laughs> I and you'll argue with me about how it's a B film. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. Batman vs Superman was a B film, yes. Um, it's more of a C plus. So, did you see that supposedly that Warner Brothers or actually HBO Max is losing like all the DC films? I the did end of the month? Yeah. yeah, I know that's crazy. What are you doing? I know, right? I don't understand that at all. What? What? Where do, where do they got to go? What, what's the plan? Yeah, I guess Warner Brothers was like, you know what? We're probably gonna do our own thing. We're just gonna make our own our own st- streaming service. Thanks, HBO. That would probably that wouldn't surprise me. Ridiculous. All right. So my last one for you, Matt. What are the odds that Dune, Denis Villeneuve's Denis Villeneuve's Dune nabs a Best Picture nomination? If it comes Ooh. out. Yeah, I think that there's considering I haven't even seen a trailer yet, and just I've seen some stills. Um, I'll say a sixty percent chance that it actually it gets nominated. I just so he's been nominated for best director for Arrival, yeah, right. And um, his first film, I think, in, in international, still foreign language back then, Incendies. I'm not sure how to say that. Chandon, because he's French, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. So I don't, man, because 2049 didn't get a sniff. Sicario didn't, right? Did it get a nomination? I don't think it. No, it didn't. Because I looked it up today. Yeah. I said, yeah, I don't think so. Unless I, I looked up Villeneuve nominations, I wonder if maybe they didn't count that, and it was just as a best picture nom. Because Sicario was fantastic. Uh, I don't know. So the odds that he gets it uh, a nomination, I'll say just a grand spectacle of it all. It may not be that great. Do you think it's going to be good? I don't know. I'm not. Sure. It'll be really interesting. I'm definitely on board to see it. I'm very, very curious to see it. But David Lynch's version is not particularly good. And it's not an easy novel to film or read, to be quite honest with you. Hmm. Sicario did not get an Oscar nomination for Best Picture. Cinematography, score, and editing. All nominated, no wins. Uh, I'm going to go with... I'm really being a chicken this week. I'm going to go 58%. I'm hovering those 50s, 60s this week. I'm not I'm not extremely confident, but I think just on the sheer scope of it all, uh that it that it will. Is this play is this part of like a trilogy or something, or is this a one off? It could be a one off. I guess it depends on how it goes, but I mean there are multiple Dune books. Alright. Well, I guess if they got sandworms, right? That's what all the kids are clamoring for nowadays. <laughs> yeah, that's you know, people really love sandworms. All right, so my final question. What are the odds that Karen Kusama and Blumhouse's Dracula ends up being the best version filmed? Wow. Oh, I'm going... I gotta go low. I gotta go like 28%. I mean, it may be really good, but Francis Ford Coppola's Bram Stoker's Dracula is really, really good. And the original, right? Yeah. I think the original is fantastic with Bela Lugosi. So, yeah, no, I'm not, I don't, I, I can't go high on that at all. Yeah, there's Nosferatu too, which yeah. is fantastic. Although, I can't, I just can never get around Keanu Reeves's butchering of a British accent. Oh, that is ho- that is absolutely horrible. You're entirely right. <laughs> so bad. I don't know. Um, I'm curious. We'll see. Um, I'm going to say 45% chance. I'm more confident than you are, but I still think it's not very likely. Yeah, I I'm, I'm still think it's going to be good. I'm not knocking the film, you know, but I just don't think that just the grand, the scale of that version. And Goldman is so good in that. Yeah. Or Goldman. Yeah. Oldman. Goldman. Oldman. <laughs> Sorry, I'm still thinking about tiptoes with Oldman. I know. I could not believe that. I was like, what the what the hell? Is that Gary Oldman on his knees right now? 
Folks, go go to YouTube and, and search for Tiptoes trailer and then just be amazed that this thing actually exists. We're going to have to figure out a way to discuss that at some point, Matt. I'm going to make you watch Tiptoes. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. All right. Well, that was fun. What are the odds? What do you think? What, are, what odds would you assign to those? Shoot us an email at feedback at thefirstrun.com. Next week, Matt, what are we discussing? It's going to be Never Rarely, Sometimes, Always. Mm-hmm. And then uh, what was the other one again? Uh, I forgot. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on. Let me look it up. Uh, let's see. Who's faster? Who's faster? Yeah, well, it gets. It would be Matt or me. Who's it going to be? Come on, baby. The last thing shoes. he wanted. The last thing he wanted. <sighs> Thank you. Currently on Netflix. The last thing he wanted, and never really, sometimes always, never really, sometimes always, was on my most anticipated list for the first half of this year. Mm-hmm. Initially, uh, so I'm happy we're going to be able to catch up with that. Finally, we may have a special guest, which I'm very excited about. I don't want to ruin it in case she listens to the show and is like, "Good God." I am not going to go on that, so I'm not going to reveal any names. Maybe uh, we'll do some some uh, publishing of, of that. Uh, not publishing. What's the word I'm looking for? I don't know. Promoting. Dear Promoting. God. Wow, we are professionals. 500, 500 plus, guys. Dear God. Promotion ahead of time. I got to stop recording the show so late. All right. Feedback at the first run. Check us out on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Do a search for the first run. Scroll, scroll, scroll. Eventually you will find us. Go over to Apple Podcasts and give us a review. Not only will I read it on the air, but it'll help other people find the show. All right, Matt. So let's go ahead then, take an extended break, and we will see you all soon. Take care. You can't fight in here. This is the war room.